I'm very happy that Petra Vlad and uh, Rebecca Rocha are here. They are both working for the Cinematheque Swiss, the Swiss National Film um, Archive. And I briefly introduce you, and I hope I have all the information. I, I, I looked at LinkedIn. Okay. <laughs> so, but uh, Petra is chief curator of the non-film department in the Cinematheque Swiss. Um, she holds a master in information and communication sciences, museology and new media, as well as art history. Yes, and uh, Rebecca Rocha <laughs> is uh, the head of, of the Digital Heritage Division. Some of you may um, know her also from the 3D scanning project we are doing together with the Cinematheque. And uh, she holds um, a master in digital heritage, which she did in, at the University of York and the Bachelor of Arts uh, in Conservation and Restoration Science. And I'm very much looking forward to your talk and um, thank you that you are here. I hope it works. The micro? It's okay. It should. It should. So, yeah. okay. So thank you very much for this invitation, Mr. Fornaro. What a better place to speak about heritage if it's not Rome. So we are very honored to be today here. Um, we are on the other side of the table as you. So we are not a university, we are an archive. And we came today here in order to present you our problematics today of the digital shift that uh, film related or non-film collections uh, are living today. Um, Next, so these are uh, our collection challenges. Um, our presentation will be divided in two parts. For my part, I will address the managerial strategies that are necessary to respond to the paradigm shift that digital technology imposes on the management of film-related collections. And Rebecca will talk to you about the technical strategies that arise from these new collection practices. We will first look at the heritage philosophy behind the film-related collections, or as we call it in French, the non-film collections, <laughs> and then um, the uh, <clears throat> shift of paradigm that is necessary today. First of all, uh, from the point of view of the history of the heritage, talk about film archives is talking about the youngest and the most problematic of the uh, institutions whose core business is to safeguard, study, conserve, and transmit uh, material heritage. This is because the technical and artistic creations, the industries linked to the seventh art are also the most recent. recent. So what is a film archive? A film archive or a cinematheque, it's an heritage institution, more often financed by a governmental entity, so very rare private uh, institutions. Uh, and it's the most uh, young of the, her sisters, archives, libraries, or museums. And that's for a cinematheque or a film archive. It's all this together. It's a glam in itself. We are a gallery, we are a library, an archive, and a museum. We have all these aspects in our, in our collection. Um, the first thought about the archiving film was not a conservation one, the premises of the cinematic was the dissemination of the cinema in theaters and uh, the consciousness of a heritage um, practice came at the end of the 20th century and which uh, goes us today to new practices uh, which are uh, more and more complicated since the digital shift. That's why today um, we are starting to question uh, once again what is a cinematic and what is a film collection. The first change which came for us is that we have a policy of collection, a philosophy that uh, concerns us, and we wonder um, the question about the durability of the collection that we are having in our collection in the regard of the immense heterogeneity of the materials that we conserve. We have all kinds of uh, supports for the film collections and for the film-related collections. We have films on nitrate, on isotat, on polyester, and the digital-born film, and uh, virtual reality works. We have, for the non-film collection or the film-related, we have all types of posters, photographic uh, archives, 
uh, we have also all the documentation links to, linked to these productions, the library, the books, the paper and the electronic archives, the handwritten type scripts or digital scripts for the films. And we have two dimensional or three dimensional scans of digitizations of this object for which we do not have today a consistent policy of, uh, of conservation. So one of the most important questions today for us is how to document this heterogeneity of the collections, which database use, and how to link the different databases which link our different, uh, different uh, practices. It's not the same thing, uh, documenting a film or uh, documenting an archive or an iconography collection. Uh, so our main project, which occupies us, uh, me and Rebecca, since two years, is to build this database, which permits uh, us to work in a collaboration between the different departments of the Cinematec and also to open us towards other archives. Another problem linked to this is how to make these collections accessible. Our biggest difficulty is that we have a huge collection. The Swiss Cinematheque is one of the first cinematic in the world. We are the six uh, exactly on the FIAF, the Federation of the International Archive Film Collections, in order of the grandeur of the collections. We have about 4 million objects only on the film related, on the non-film collections. And we speak here only about our analogical collections. Uh, if we try to estimate today the necessary time in order only to make um, an identification of the element on the non-film collections, we'll need about eight people to work uh, full-time for 25 years, which we do not have and <laughs> do not intend to hire neither. So that's why we are in a, it's the first step toward our changing of the paradigm. So what is uh, Cinematech? It's uh, once again a heritage institution, and like any heritage institution, it, go, it, it functions on the PRC model, which was designed by Peter van Mensch, which means that every cultural institution since their creation on the 16th century even, every collection works on this model, the preservation of something, material, cultural objects, its research and its communication. And during these five centuries of history of these cultural institutions, the different functions was changed. So if the first, uh, for the beginning, the principal concern of people concerning this kind of heritage institution was the preservation, the collection, and not at all the opening or the communication of this content, we arrived, I've arrived today in the 21st century of a total change of this way of function, our uh, core business today is to communicate the content that we have in our collection. And we are uh, in this digital, I, I, I might say again, uh, shift of paradigm, concerned about how to do this communication in order that all the other elements, the research and the preservation can be increased. So if I take once again this, uh, this, uh, this model, the first problem, uh, which occurs to our archive today, uh, it's the acquisition. The Swiss Cinematheque collection, uh, it's a young one. We have only 80 years. We'll have it next year, 75 years, for be precise. Uh, we have a mass acquisition policy. This means that we go to a producer of archives Producer, producers of film and producers of all which is a promotion material and we made the acquisition of these collections without any criteria of uh, um, uh, any curatorial criteria or any aesthetical criteria our main job is to conserve in our walls everything which uh, happens in switzerland linked to the film so there are two principles which govern this kind of uh, Pollution acquisition a collection. It's the notion of Helvetica. Don't everything which is produced in Switzerland must be conserved in our archive and some unica collection. This means objects that are having a certain history and aesthetic value from the international produ productions of the cinema might be um, uh, findable in our collections. And we have um, uh, the big difference with other cinematics or other countries, we do not have uh, the legal deposit of the collections, only the films that are financed by the uh, 
OFC, Office Federal de la Culture, Cultural Office of Switzerland, only this film arrive automatically in our collection. For the rest of the object, we must go by our own and proceed to these acquisitions. Another problem linked to this mass acquisition collection is that we do not have a strategy for the digital preservation of these collections. And this is linked again, once again to the digital shift. Since 2010, everything which is produced uh, in, linked to the communication of the film collection is digital. So we must go on the website and download content which will permit to um, have um, this element available for the history of the cinema. Another problem, it's linked to the difficulties to study these collections. Uh, since we are a young institution, the first uh, four decades linked to this, uh, the history of this kind of collections are very, very lacunary since uh, the conscience of the value of this object was not born, which was important for the cinematic at that time was to disseminate the movies. So our collection is very incomplete. So we have a large amounts of the history of cinema, which are missing in our collections. And that they have this as the second half of the history of these collections, starting in the eighties, it's a great accumulation of collections. We started to think about the value of this object. So since that day, we accumulate, accumulate everything that we find without any curatorial distinctions. So we have two difficulties, once the lack, the lack of collections and the other one, the excessive accumulation of these collections. And the most uh, difficult thing for us today is that our collection are addressing only to sp film specialists, uh, which means that uh, in absence of uh, web, uh, full web databases, in absence of a complete inventory of our objects, only specialists can come and do study in our collections, in our archives, which is for us very embarrassing. And that's why we are here today to, pre to present our problems and maybe to, to invite you to help us in, uh, in, this, uh, in these problematics. So the most difficult uh, thing which changes about the, the acquisition uh, policy is that since today, the film and non-film or film-related collection, the separation was made on the object. Uh, everything which was moving was a film, everything which was not moving was a non-film, or the film related. Today, uh, this things change a little and we are shifting our policy of collections, not on the object, but on the subject, which means that film collections are today part of the non-film collections. So we have uh, in the management point of view, we are two departments, the film and the film related collections, but in the core subject of what we collect, things have already changed. So as you see an example here, posters are moving today. So not only the videos like what we are discussing today must be archived in our, in our non-film archive, but only the, uh, the, the main objects linked to the, the, the original core business of our activity start to, to move also. So this is problematic since, since everything is digital and we have several uh, important uh, questions, philosophical questions linked to these collections. So what is the base core of our non-film collections today? What is the status of these film related collections? What about its uniqueness, especially in the born digital domain? Uh, seeing also that since today, many cinematics had this have and continue to have the same objects that we have with Swiss Cinematheque. And how uh, can we build a new criteria for uh, this collection to be resolved? Um, another problem, it's linked to the archiving. How can we archive all these different typology of objects? And how, always, um, how can we archive also all that we are producing in order to know these collections. We started to do with Rebecca one, one year ago, 3D models in order to archive the most fragile objects in our collections, like puppets, for example, which are very fragile and which are disintegrating. We start to do 3D scans in order to have a, a, a testimony of these objects, but we do not have the knowledge to know how these 3D models must be archived. 
and how will we catalog all the, the elements that we have in our collections since there is no um, international um, accord on how to, to make the shift between the archival studies and our historical studies. Do we have a mass um, te technique of the study of collection or an art history view, which uh, um, ask us to go in the detail and to see every object by itself? And then most, the, the last and the most important question about cataloging, what, how to deal the digital bulk. Uh, this means we have a lot of um, cineasts, a lot of producers, which give us uh, hard disk, hard drives, and uh, we just have to manage all this content. We do not have the resources, neither, neither the methodologies. And for the communication part of our collections, what strategies to adopt? What will we speak about? Will we speak about cinema? Will we be speaking about archives? Will we speak on what kind of platform, what will publish on this platform, movies that already exist, uh, archive, how to link it to the movies, and what about the crowdsourcing, seeing that today we are four documentalists and two archivists in our institution, how can we know all the, the history of the cinema in order to better catalog all our uh, elements of the collection. So the one of the hypotheses will be to open the collections and to practice the crowdsourcing. This means all these philosophical questions lead us to managerial challenges. And we are faced today, uh, very honestly in front of you, <laughs> we have uh, serious managerial problems since we have digital workflows, but we will have, uh, no, analog workflows, but we will have digital tools. Uh, we have a lack of updated collection policy. Our collection policy is, uh, was refounded in 2015, so she has only seven years but she's already obsolete because it doesn't include all notion of uh, digital content. And we lack standard for cataloging all the elements of our collections, standard which can confound the archives, the library, the museum collections, and the film collections. But we are still alive. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I, as an art historian, try to take this model, which functions in the museum, which is the model fixed by uh, Alois Riegel at the beginning of the 20th century. In a museum, we must study the objects according to their value. So we have different kind of uh, value according to the importance of the object. I skip to the next example. So I will try to play a game since we are in Rome. So. <laughs> starting from uh, Alois Riegel classification, which is an intentional object of an archive, for example, Triumphal Arc in, here in Rome, it's our Helvetica collections. Uh, the ancient value of an object, the Coliseum, for example, corresponds to us to the early cinema objects, the zoetrope and other, which have also a historical value. Uh, commemorative objects will be, for example, the Cologne of Traian, and in our collection, this might correspond to solar uh, posters of the festival or Locarno or uh, any other production that the Swiss Cinematic made. An accidental value in our collection, I found the example of the Desmet mute film posters, which are posters, um, international posters, film, uh, international film on the mute period of the film. So this means really the first uh, decade of the 20th century. It was a lost collection, uh, refounded 20 years ago, and most of the posters on these collections correspond to film that disappeared. So we could buy uh, two years ago a large part of these collections. The other part is in Amsterdam at the I uh, Film Archive. So accidentally, this part of the history, international history of the film, it's in Switzerland, but we do not know what to is linked, what movies, what kind of archive. Some of them are constitute only of an image. We do not have neither the title, neither nothing, nothing about the film creation. So it's an accident that this kind of object arrived in our collection, but they certainly have a value. A value of uniqueness, which is um, very rare for a cinematic, since the cinematic is constituted 
by reproducible objects. I mean, posters and photographs find in all the other cinematic, all the other archives. But it happens that sometimes we have unique collections. For instance, we have a photography of Georges Méliès, which is painted by himself. Here again, it's a unique object, but it's in the Swiss Cinematic by accident. And it has an historical and a national value, and it was intentional. So all these uh, regal criteria, uh, I, I can see once again, are very um, actual for an ancient way to see art history. For the aesthetic value uh, in a poster that I had presented at the beginning of the presentation of the film L'Inhumain, from of Marcel Lerbier. And for the technical value, we can mention Pantheon here in Rome and, for example, the Bolix camera, which was produced in Switzerland. So all this, um, uh, this separation in the different values of objects in the art history has no pertinence today for us. So we decided to split our collections only in two values, the documentary value and the heritage value. The documentary will allow us to make a mass treatment of our collections, uh, trying to have um, mass digitization projects, which will allow us to extract the metadata of identification of the objects uh, by OCR or HTR. And this uh, allowed us to do uh, uh, inventory digitization, which will be the basis for the deep art of any research project, uh, project for researcher. And the heritage value of the objects, this will allow us to, that starting from the documentary point of view to de develop a research project, uh, which will invite the researchers to do, to do identification and uh, connections between the elements of our collections. And for these meanings, we are doing today 3D digitization or digitization in high resolution. What we will need about our, our, um, with all these techniques, we need uh, an automatization of our tax, uh, tasks. So what I told about the mass digitization, the use of artificial intelligence and the coordination with other institutions. Since in our collections, we have, for instance, a large collection of uh, French uh, posters, we should do a partnership with the French Cinematheque or uh, with the German or Italian Cinematheque. The problem is that we are one of the richest cinematheques in, in Europe, so other cinematheques can do not allow even the, 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 the shorter part of the, of the uh, project that we start to, to do. And we shall do also, we dream to do, linked to open data projects linked to our collections. So all this part is more like a dream for us. <laughs> we'll try to, to, to arrive to it one day. And uh, since now, since uh, one year and a half, since Rebecca is with us, she, start, she started a little um, test project in order to augment our, uh, our standards and our technologies for study our collection. So I'll let her present you okay. this part. Thank you, Rebecca. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you about the brainstorming of how we do the digitization part uh, in the collection. So, so like Petra said, uh, we have a board in the non-time uh, uh collection. We have a broad range of materials and typologies. So as you can see for, from analog, so we have uh, projectors, cameras, posters, uh, drawings, uh, Mavie de Courgette puppets, if you know the movie, um, Bolex camera, negatives, uh, uh, posters from different size, uh, positive, uh, a lot of archive. It includes uh, and written, and written uh, documents, uh, also scripts uh, and notebook from directors and sketchbook, as you can see with uh, Maxenko. So you have this from analog and then you have the digital collection and it's get trickier with uh, the digital one because um, with, with analog, you see what you get. I mean, you see that it is a box and you see how, la how large it is. Uh, with a hard drive, uh, it can contain thousands, especially if it's a hard drive or, or uh, multiple uh, terabytes. Uh, yeah, it's a headache to, to manage uh, this kind of, of collection. Uh, you have just in this slide uh, an example of uh, the graph is an example 
of uh, 200,000 uh, files uh, in the iconography collection. So as you can see, it's mainly JPEG, but you can imagine that it is uh, 70 uh, di different file formats that we can find in a single uh, collection. Um, as so you can see, what, uh, I don't know if you grew up with CDR or <laughs> ZIP or JAZZ or uh, this kind of thing. So we also need to have to know how to process uh, this type of, of storage media. Um, I just made um, an example. For example, the CDR that you see that is uh, written unreadable uh, with the posters. It's a Lord of the Ring uh, uh, CDR with uh, the teaser posters. But actually, it's not unreadable. It was just made uh, in an Apple environment. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're using the right tools, you're going you're gonna to be fine. So, <laughs> so you can see that if you, if you don't have the tools to read it, you, you say, oh my god, we, I cannot read it. But actually, we can, but you, ha you have to find uh, the, right, the right methodology and workflow to, to do it. Uh, so yeah, so with analog, with digital, you need uh, different um, a specific digitization station. Uh, you cannot digitize a negative uh, with, with a book scanner. You can try, but it's not going to end up in a, in a good way. Uh, so the station is, depends on the typology of the objects. And, but at the end, it's the same workflow. We have a core workflow uh, with some adjustment uh, depending on the type of object. And so the talk today, we're going to talk about some of the adjustments we did uh, with different type of uh, object in, in the collection. So yeah, just a quick for the analog, you have, we have a copy stand uh, for opaque documents. Uh, we have a transparent copy stand for, uh, yeah. So the copy stand we were using for the uh, photographic uh, collection uh, with flashes and uh, a digital camera. Uh, for the transparent copy stand, it's the same, uh, um, it's the same uh, type of material. We just have uh, the flash under the, the object. Uh, so it's perfect for negative uh, digitization. We use photogrammetry, so for the uh, 3D objects, uh, it's from Mavie de Courgette to Bodex camera, so it's every 3D things. I mean, we don't, haven't tried yet very huge, uh, uh, like a huge projector or a set. We haven't done a, a, a movie set uh, yet. We never know, <laughs> someday. Uh, and we're using a digital camera back uh, for posters, uh, so it allows us to have a right high resolution with uh, the digital digital back, uh, and we have a vacuum table, so it's very practical when the, the poster is not flat enough. We we can just use the vacuum table to lay lay it flat, and also we have a, a book scanner for uh, every archival type of documents, so uh, um, script, uh, correspondence, uh, and so on. And it moves us to the digital um, st storage media uh, station. So it's the same, it's a, com it's a computer. We just have different type of uh, uh, computer readable uh, uh, station. So you can see that we have for floppy disk, uh, for CDR, and for hard drive. Uh, because you are, with computer readable uh, object, you cannot process instantly. You need to retrive the content. And you, ha you have to do it correctly using metadata and using the right tools to not alter uh, the content. Uh, also, as Petra said earlier, we can, it can contain large amounts of documents. So the pipeline for this uh, data storage media, media is underway. Um, so we are looking at to have a pipeline, pipeline that allows us to, to imagine, extracting, accessioning, and allow the long-term archiving of the data. Uh, so for the imaging and extracting computer data storage, uh, the methodology will be presented uh, at Hypress uh, in Glasgow uh, this year uh, with uh, Robin Francois, who is the digital archivist in the collection. And also we have currently uh, Denis Bussard, who is a student at the science, uh, Applied Science in Geneva, who is doing his, his, his master dissertation and investigating and uh, to apprise digital work. Because when you have a hard drive, of a movie director, you can imagine that we have thousands of files, and sometimes with um, a movie uh, movie directors, you can imagine um, you have many files with um, it can be the same files but with a different 
a name. For example, you can imagine that you have uh, script final one, script, script final one, one, script final one. <laughs> you can imagine everything. So um, it is important for us to, to, to say what, what do we keep? We, can, we cannot keep everything uh, because it, it, it's like archiving. You have to do a selection at some point, but you have to, you have to, have to policy, a collection policy. And that's why Petra was mentioning that we have to update it, the policy to, to allow us to, to apprise this digital book. And Denis Bussard is doing. Um, a, a project on testing different type of software that allow us to, to identify uh, uh, versioning, to identify uh, identical, uh, identical files, and then to say, how do you select a different type of, of, of object? So it's on the web um, for today. Um, well, just the, the quick view of the, the core workflow. So it's, it's going to be the same for every type of object. So we, we always started with uh, cataloging. We do not. We do not accept uh, documents that have not been uh, catalogued because it's the starting to have a headache later on. Uh, with every digitization project, you have to do the, the calibration using uh, targets, uh, not only tar uh, color targets. Then you digitize uh, the collection. You process it, for example, for OCR or HTR. And then we do the quality control. The quality control is the visual inspection of um, uh, the dig digitized file. So it's checking if it's sharp enough, um, if there is a color problem. And we have what we call uh, the quality assurance. So it's automatic. The quality control is manual. The quality assurance is uh, manual, uh, is automatic because we, we are checking the checksum, we are checking uh, uh, technical metadata. Uh, and uh, so we are checking the file format, for example, if it's, if it's a right file format for preservation, uh, because you can imagine that with 70 different type of file formats, you have to have a policy of what you, you keep and how to transcode in a correct uh, file format. Uh, of course, we're doing the digital archiving of uh, this uh, digitized and bond digital content using the well-known uh, OIS standard, uh, and then what we'll, we'll love to do is uh, to disseminate and uh, give access to, to the collection. But yeah, it's depending on a lot of, as it is cinema, we have a lot of rights management uh, thing to, to consider. So just for uh, the brainstorming that we are doing in the division and the department, I'm going to talk to you about the digitization and the processing. And so I'm going to talk about two use cases with uh, adjustments of the methodology. The first one uh, is uh, handwritten documents uh, using transcribers. So it's a good thing that we, we follow <laughs> Tobias. <laughs> so we, we are uh, doing some, some tests with, uh, with tr transcribers because uh, with OCR, uh, don't bother with OCR for, for handwritten documents, it's just unreadable. And of course, the free dig digitization of some of the uh, Puppets of Ma Vie de Courgette, uh, yeah, using uh, photogrammetry. So uh, the use case I'm going to talk about to you uh, for the end writing text reconnection is um, the film and trilogues. And why do I want to talk about this collection, this type of object? Is because it's the first entry we have of every item in the collection of the movie uh, that entered the collection. So it has. Uh, documentary and heritage, an important heritage value as well. And it was mainly handwritten by Freddy Buage, so the, the, the former uh, director of the Swiss Film Archive from, as you can see, from a very long time, from 1951 to 1996. And so the logs span from 1943 to the two, uh, 2000. So we did the first test and training model using transcribers. It's uh, around 25 uh, logs. Uh, in French, German, Italian, and English. Uh, oh, sorry. So it's always the, the structure is the same for the logs. So you always start with a column of IDs. Then you have uh, the movie title, the directors. So you can see that we have very um, core metadata at the, uh, from the start. Uh, we have who the, the society of the person who deposit the, the objects. We have uh, the reels number, 
uh, is if it's a deposit of property and we have at the end which is very important for us is the technical notes mm -hmm. relating to the to the to the reels um so for the, the workflow of uh, using transcribers so um well we always started with uh, uploading the documents and from from there we're using the page segmentation into text and regions uh, and for the byline as well so with with uh, the page segmentation we're using so the layout analysis uh, with sitlab advance and then we do the text recognition we started with without transcribe transcribing we we said oh we, we, we're going to try with a, a model that is already been uh, uh, test and develop. So we use the French, uh, transcribe is French model one. And from there, we, we apply this model to different type of pages. And then we transcribe the errors from the model because we were lucky enough that the model of the French model was very close to the Freddy Buach and writing. So we have to train less words than what was expected. And from there, we use, we train a specific model of a theme logs model and by adding different training sets, validation sets. And of course, we evaluate uh, the accuracy of the model using the uh, um, learning curve uh, graph. And so at the end, we were able to apply the newly uh, model to, to new pages to see if it's work or not. Um, yeah, so you just have a, a quick view of how do you transcri transcribe the, the content. So it's, it's very easy, easy to use. To, uh, so that's one of me of the great thing about this type of software. You don't have to be uh, a computer scientist to, to use it. So it's it's very a very good thing to to have. Um, just a quick look at uh, the co a comparison between the base model, so the French base model, and the FIMLOG uh, uh, train model. So as you can see, it has improved uh, the content. Uh, well, it can look gibberish. Uh, <laughs> But I can just explain that sometimes it says, um, for example, if you took the line uh, 312, it says uh, it's in original version uh, um, in Italian. Uh, the subtitles is in French, German, and it is, it is in color and it is uh, SIF, so safe. So it's not, it's not lightweight. So that's what it's saying. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of coding for the, the logs, but it says a lot of that, about the reels. Um, so yeah, you can see that it has improved with the, the FIMLOG model. So it was, especially that, that, yeah, you can see that it is, it can be tricky to, because sometimes the letters are very close, close closely uh, attached. Um, so yeah, like I said, the advantages is that uh, has Transcribers is a community driven platform. So we have shared trained models. Uh, I think I would not be here today if we haven't had the Transcribers French <laughs> model uh, with more than 1 million words transcribed. It was a very um, good thing to have this, this ground model to, to start and to, pull, to, put, uh, to, to put a top model uh, for the film logs. Um, and that's why it's like I said, it, it, the ease of use is very um, uh, appreciated, and also with uh, the many online documentation. But still, <laughs> it's not perfect. I mean, <laughs> it will not be perfect. So we have some uh, typical challenges. Uh, it's it's mainly practical challenges. So there was uh, the case of Bob. I'm going to talk to you about Bob. Uh, <laughs> Bob is the uh, is the abbreviation of reels in French. In French, uh, reels is said bobin. So in the log, it was uh, Bob. Many times it was Bob. And so uh, the French model uh, has a bit of a tricky times with uh, letters uh, with uh, Bob. So for example, it has uh, confused uh, 0, 8 for O and 6 for B. Uh, so for example, I, I put you three different examples. So it's for always Bob. We always have a problem with Bob. <laughs> so as you can see, we, yeah, we have the at the um, middle uh, images, you have two, uh, 20, uh, 32 with uh, 4686, and it should be said for Bob, but you can see it's, it's, not, it's not bad. So with only 10,000 words, we were able to correct, uh, no, we, don't, we didn't do 10,000 Bob, we used 10,000 words uh, globally, <laughs> and we were able to, to correct uh, that, uh, that uh, typical and systematic uh, mistake. And also, 
you can imagine that with a strike through words, it's going to be also tricky. Well, in a simple strike through transcribe is a, uh, doesn't mind, I can read that. Well, when, when it is a complex strike through, well, even a human has difficulty reading it, so you can imagine that <laughs> a computer can have a tricky time as well. Uh, but there is an issue with, um, because in the logs it is strike through, and with uh, transcribers, it doesn't say that it is strike through. For example, for if you take the first line, uh, it doesn't say, there is no um, um, contextualization that it is strike through. So you have to add further information to say that it, it was strike through and it is not, because it, it has meaning in strike through. And also, we're doing crowdsourcing within the institution because sometimes you, the, the machine is re reading very, it's transcribing very funnily. And you have to, either you don't know the context to, to know exactly what it's saying, but you have to, yeah, to, you have to have uh, crowdsourcing with uh, colleagues that say, oh, that's what it's saying. So we, we are having fun with that. Um, just a quick, uh, it's going to be shorter, uh, a quick overview of what we're doing in 3D uh, digitization. So why we are, why 3D? I, um, and because 3D is, can be very expensive depending on what technology you, you are applying. It can be also uh, subjective. Uh, I can, I'm going to go to that later, but you have the aim is to do a 3D surrogate uh, in cinematic heritage, especially with uh, Mavid de Courgette, because the puppets are not aimed to, to last for a very long, long time because it's polymer and it can, it's, it can be uh, very quickly degrading. And so, so we, we love to, to disseminate, uh, for example, cameras, bullet camera uh, on Sketchfab, et cetera, et cetera. So the rationale is to preserve uh, the object appearance at, at a given time, especially with uh, Courgette. Huh? and also provide an insight uh, into the cinematic heritage. And also, uh, we have to choose uh, affordable techniques. Uh, we, we, will, we will not start with uh, 3D uh, scanners that can do billions of point clouds. So we're using photogrammetry and we're adding on top of it some computer graphics software. And also it's important for us that it is non-invasive techniques and we have issues uh, as if you know photogrammetry, you can very easily get issue with um, transparency and shiny things. And as an inst cultural institution, you just cannot spray an opaque painting on it. So, <laughs> so that's why we only get non-invasive technique. Uh, I think this is the video. I don't know if it's going to play. Um, no. It's possible to play the video. I don't know. Entra mio fianco. Questa. Ah, je pense qu'on va. Oui. <laughs> It's appropriate. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it's in French and German. Oh. La Cinémathèque Suisse a reçu en 2017 une partie du fonds d'objets utilisés pour la production du film avec Courgette. Et euh, du fait de leur euh, composition, donc c'est notamment des, des plastiques hein, qui peuvent se dégrader assez rapidement, on a mis sur pied un projet de numérisation en 3D donc de, de ces marionnettes. Hein à la fois du coup pour un accès au public, mais aussi à valeur de préservation euh, numérique. Donc quand on souhaite du coup numériser le, un objet en trois dimensions, donc le but c'est vraiment de prendre des, des centaines de photos vraiment pour faire une couverture complète de l'objet. Et plus on a de photos, plus le résultat, la reconstruction en 3D sera, sera précise. Pour euh, la figurine d'Alice, nous avons euh, 200 photos qui vont nous permettre du, du, justement de pouvoir euh, en faire un modèle 3D. Dans les activités de la Cinémathèque, il y a vraiment le but, on va dire, de la préservation donc, du patrimoine cinématographique, d'où ce, ce projet de numérisation des figurines, pour vraiment avoir une copie de sauvegarde de, ce, de ces objets patrimoniaux. C'est-à-dire qu'on aura une copie de l'objet en 2021, euh, qui, est encore, qui représente encore ce qu'on voit, dans, par exemple, dans le film. 
Thank you. So as you can see with the, oh. <laughs> Thank you. So with the, oh. oh, there you go. So as you can see with the um, Mavie de Courgette puppets, so it's the workflow for the, the puppets. Um, there are some, some tricky uh, elements. Um, I didn't know if you saw the, the eye in the video, but it is very shiny. So we, with photogrammetry, it was, it became an horror movie because the eye was just uh, missing a lot of, of uh, elements. So we have to use computer graphic software to, to apply a new eye uh, to, to the puppets. And also we have a lot of uh, minuscule, uh, the mouths are, are very small. So you use, we have to use micro photogrammetry as well. So for, for puppets, we have two different type of uh, uh, approach with uh, photogrammetry, standard photogrammetry and macro photogrammetry. Uh, so we're using MetaShape uh, to do the processing of uh, the, the photograph, uh, and we're using different type of uh, element to, to check the accuracy of, of the model, not, notably uh, the gradual selection. And like I said, we're using, um, we use uh, Autodesk uh, 3DX Max to, do the, the, uh, to apply the new eye to, 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 the, obj uh, to the object. Um, so when you're doing this type of, of, of digitization, the output uh, is crucial. So you, have, you want an output for preservation, but it's still in uh, the preservation standard are still in their infancy. Uh, the Library of, of Congress is uh, currently doing some works on how to preserve uh, 3D uh, format, file format. And you also have to, to have a solution to, oh, sorry, uh, to apply it to uh, Sketchfab. You cannot upload uh, the preservation model to, to Sketchfab, so you have to, to do a dissemination, a disseminated uh, model of it. Um, with 3D, uh, the paradata uh, thing of 3D object uh, is crucial because uh, it is still uh, a huge, huge of human uh, factors taking, uh, to doing the settings and it is a lot of choice, human choices to create a 3D model. So you have to know exactly what you've done because like in, in, a, in every science project, you need to, to be able to redo the model with the same data set. And the paradata is, is your, uh, like we said in French, feuille de route. And also, like I said, uh, we have to check the model accuracy of the model. So we're using uh, what in Metashape, what is called the RMS, uh, root mean square value in Metashape. So uh, it's a good indication of where you're standing with uh, the quality of your model. Uh, but also you have the color rendering uh, with uh, the texture and uh, uh, of, of the object. But I, I always love to say that, I mean, this decision is already an interpretation because it's always the, it has already many choices. So it's not, it will be never be the same of uh, objects. So it's already an interpretation and 20 years from now, it's gonna be a new model that is gonna be different. So it's important to always keep that in mind that it is an, an interpretation. Yeah, a quick look at of different steps, but yeah, you always started with the cloud and you end up with uh, a texture model. And so we, we did uh, a video because I actually you, you in the video you saw uh, Alice with its uh, character uh, Alice um, without uh, a mouse, uh, a mouth. Uh, so we have uh, the boxes we use we call them the emotions uh, box set of uh, the collection. And so we did, we did, we did the, the mouth separately, and then we added uh, with uh, a computer graphic, and we created a video that we put uh, uh, on Sketchfab. Uh, the tricky thing is about Sketchfab, and also because it's cinematic, uh, cinema, a cinematic uh, object from recent movies, you just cannot <laughs> put it like that uh, online. You have to have agreement uh, with uh, the directors uh, and uh, um, and before we do, actually, before, before we, done the, we have done the, the project, uh, we, had, we asked Claude Barras uh, if it was okay with him because it was a stop motion movie and we were doing 3D digitization. So it can be seen as uh, um, 
uh, how to say it, uh, uh, it can be problematic uh, with uh, how the, the project was done. So very quickly, uh, because we, we, we've, we love to do a lot of brainstorming and have ideas to do the mid, like Petra said, we're using the mass digitization aspect and with mass digitization, it implies uh, metadata extraction. So it, it's a very, very quickly uh, overlook at the next step for us. And the next step for us, especially if we are doing um, mass digitization is the metadata extraction of the posters. Just two uh, different examples. So you have uh, the petite fugue, um, a tesseract OCR of a poster. So you can see that it, it was, without training, very straightforward and correct because it's, it was not with different type of uh, specific fonts or different type of uh, graphical elements. With uh, uh, Hollywood movies, it can be very, <laughs> it's, it's much trickier. So, with Tesseract, just no, there was no, no output that was usable. And of course, uh, Google <laughs> Drive was perfect. <laughs> it, it, was, it was able to, to extract all the unstoppable, unstoppable movies posters with a simple search request. And I did try just for fun to use uh, the built-in iPhone uh, Live OCR. And also it wasn't, it wasn't that good as well because it says Lunstoma or Unstoppy. So yeah. So there's work to be done, especially for this type of movie posters. And that's why I'm going to let you for the first part of the conclusion. Of, yes, yeah. just to say that we are now today in a, in a not a, only a technological shift, but in a managerial one. So we can do not conceive our jobs today in a cultural institution on the model of the, of the cultural theory, as it was in the 20th century. We'll have to have empirical approaches in our digital digitization methodologies and our workflows, and we'll have to seriously reflect about archiving all our products. Mm -hmm. So that's from us. Thank you.